Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you and welcome to, jo to the AMCA Grand Rounds Music Therapy Practice in COVID-19 World. My name is Heather Wagner and I am currently serving as a member of the AMCA COVID-19 Task Force, which is the sponsor for this Grand Round series. Um, we hope that you've had a chance to check out some of the submissions to the AMTA COVID-19 Songwriting Contest. Um, you can view all the submissions on the AMTA YouTube channel. We encourage you also to view the many resources on the AMTA COVID-19 webpage and reach out to us with any questions or suggestions and needs that you may be having. So before I introduce our presenter for the session, I ask that you keep yourself muted to minimize distraction for our presenter and viewers. The session is being recorded. Uh, use the chat to ask questions of the presenter. We will have a 10 minute question and answer period toward the end of the session. Um, and I guess this session is being recorded and will be posted to the COVID-19 resource page. So this evening's presentation is called Going Offline Online, Understanding Fear, Trauma and Resilience with Technology. And our presenter is Alexandra Wilson. She is a music therapist and smart living coordinator for LAD, which is an organization that provides housing options for persons with disabilities, as well as work support and adult day services in the Cincinnati, Ohio era, area. Alexandra is trained in trauma response. She has a trauma response care certification uh, and which brings a blend of music therapy, trauma informed care and home and personal care expertise to her job. So Alexandra, welcome and please take it away. Thank you, Heather. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the intersections between uh, trauma responsive care or trauma informed care as it's often called and um, music therapy and technology. So when I think of trauma informed care, um, one of the most essential components of that, that process, that approach is um, rebuilding um, relationships, um, establishing that person to person connection. Um, and oftentimes we think of technology as almost providing the opposite for people. Um, but I think a lot of our COVID experiences are really challenging that um, in the sense that you know, technology has been able to keep us connected in a way um, throughout a time where we can't be together physically. Um, Beyond the pandemic, I think that technology um, can have a lot of benefits in our music therapy practice from a trauma-informed uh, care lens um, as well. Um, so when we think about social distancing, that feels safe to people beyond the pandemic sometimes, especially for our individuals who are neuro neurodiverse or who have um, um, who are su survivors of of trauma, that high level of feedback we get from uh, in-person interaction can be overwhelming and dysregulating at times. So interacting through and with technology can provide a safe distance for those individuals. In addition, music technology especially gives us access to a whole new world of possibilities when it comes to sounds and um, musical ideas to explore. Um, so it provides a, um, an opportunity for individuals to record, remix, um, exercise their agency, one of the core resilience factors um, that helps individuals overcome challenges. So a little bit about me, um, I started off my career as a music therapist, um, as a community music therapist, um, doing pretty much exclusively group work. And um, for me, technology was um, part of my practice um, because of my work with individuals on the autism spectrum and also because of my work with teenagers, you know, 
electronic music was the music that they were connecting with. And as well, I noticed um, with some of my clients on the autism spectrum, um, interacting through and with technology allowed them to reach a higher level of interaction, connection, and engagement, not only with me, but also with their peers. Um, since all of my um, clinical work um, throughout, you know, the first three years of my practice was pretty much in group settings, um, COVID, as for many of us, <laughs> switched me over to doing telehealth. And with only doing groups, um, it was a real challenge for me um, within the organization that I used to work for. And unfortunately, as many people were in this um, circumstance, I went in a course of a few months from being a telehealth music therapist to being an unemployed <laughs> music therapist. Um, and so I had to pivot yet again <laughs> and um, find something where, you know, I could stay in my community that I loved, um, that was stable for me um, as a person, but continue to use my skills as a music therapist. Um, so I was really lucky to find a job as a smart living coordinator. Um, so essentially I um, am managing um, a house of individuals who are, um, uh, it's a smart house. So it's filled with assistive technologies. Um, and we are doing a three-year pilot to try to see what is the highest capacity that we can take remote supports um, to help people with their day-to-day -day life. Could we really take remote supports and completely fade out um, in-person direct support for individuals with disabilities by implementing remote supports and assistive technologies. You know, let's really test how far the technology has, has come. Um, and with that, as a music therapist, what I'm so excited about is the research element. And as well, the opportunity to, tr to teach and help these individuals with their, their non-musical goals. Um, you know, as a music therapist, that's what we love to do. So I had to really <laughs> show some resilience myself throughout the last few months in order to adapt into a new landscape for us as music therapists. Um, but as much as I have embraced technology in my clinical practice, I am no stranger to the challenges that that brings to us, the barriers that um, technology introduces into our sessions, whether they're in person or telehealth. Um, one of the first few nights that I worked in the house, um, one of the guys who lives here was just trying to call his mom on his remote support tablet that was connected to a Bluetooth speaker. And I thought I tried everything to fix it. I tried messing with the Bluetooth receiver on his tablet. I tried changing the audio settings. I tried uh, hanging up and calling back on mom. But no matter what I tried, it seemed like I could not get it to work. Lo and behold, my coworker comes in to troubleshoot the next morning, and it turns out Bluetooth speakers lose battery. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So, um, yeah, I just didn't plug it in. So that was kind of a moment where I was like, I cannot believe that I've accepted this job. As a tech coordinator, I will never succeed if I can't figure out how to plug in a Bluetooth speaker. I took a step back and I remembered my trauma responsive care training and I said, okay, actually, I can totally justify this to myself because when our brain is in a fear state, it is harder for us to problem solve. Our cortex can literally go offline when we go into that fear, that flight, f fight or flight mode. Um, and 
it only seems natural that I would feel um, pressure <laughs> to prove that this technology works to an individual's mom, someone who really cares about the person who lives in this house and would be concerned if um, it none of the technology worked. So um, this is just a, a reminder of why it's so important to to do that self-reflection and and recognize that you know um, technology brings these challenges to the forefront. Um, so um, some of the strategies we can use um, not only for our clients, definitely for our clients, but also for ourselves when we're um, working with technology in sessions is to use the three P model where we predict what might happen we practice what we're gonna what it's gonna feel like and what we're gonna do when things go wrong and then we come up with a plan b so if all else fails if my first plan doesn't work what am i gonna do um, and the essential element from about this from trauma responsive care lens is we not only need to walk through the cognitive problem solving aspect of it, but we need to feel it. You know, what is it gonna feel like when I can't get this Bluetooth speaker to work? And what am I gonna do? <sighs> so practice through, regulate through, and try some things to problem solve. Um, so especially with our clients who experience things on that sensory level who need to practice those feelings in for any of us really um, we have to practice through not just the problem solving the cognitive level of it but how it's going to feel when it happens um, we know all too well that our clients can experience challenges with technology as well um, one of the great examples I have of this is um, I was working with a one-on-one -on -one client on Zoom and um, we're just, you know, singing one of his favorite songs, rocking it out, and all of a sudden he just goes, ah, <laughs> just out of nowhere. And, you know, there have definitely been Zoom meetings that I have been in where I have wanted to just shout out of nowhere too so um when we're in that tech space that we can reach that overwhelm so much faster <laughs> sometimes than when we are in in person so when individuals are expressing that that dysregulation that feeling of unsafety lack of safety what we can do is reflect on or connect so we reflect, we give back the feeling, wow, it sounds like you're feeling a lot of things right now. Okay, thank you for letting me know where you are at. How about we take a few deep breaths together? Whew. And maybe we'll grab a glass of water and then we can start a different song. Let's reset. We'll just do a different song and then they'll all be good. Um, we can do this reflect honor connect process as well as music as well um, with music, um, especially as music therapists that um, that traditional improv um, type of practice where we, you know, repeat something that a client has done musically um, to validate and then, you know, we add a variation we speed it up or we make it louder or softer um, we we change it up to create that reciprocal interaction um, you know we can think of this not just with verbal processing but also how can we reflect on or connect musically to create a safe validating environment um, as well um, we want to keep in mind the unique social environment um, when we are doing uh, telehealth, especially uh, music therapy or providing telehealth services. Um, we as music therapists know all too well 
the Zoom delay that um, just ruins my day. <laughs> um, but um, really, I think of, um, you know, we think of technology as being fast, but interaction wise, it really slows down the time it takes for me to say something and for you to receive the information. So what we can do as music therapists when we're using technology is introducing fast feedback sensory experiences. So, um, uh, you know, let's not put GarageBand on first, first introduction to um, music technology. Let's try with something a little, try something a little simpler first. Um, you know, GarageBand can even send some music therapists offline. I know it did for me <laughs> um, when I uh, when I was a new music therapist at times. Um, we also can be mindful of the sensory experience um, that online interaction provides. Um, even even if um, we're just using like music technology in an in-person session. Um, if we're stacking different recordings, that can get really overwhelming. Um, and sometimes the volume can get really overwhelming as well. Um, so we need to be sensitive to the sensory environment that we're creating with technology. And finally, um, the attention span to technology, whether it's telehealth or um, a um, if you're incorporating an app or um, a music technology in your session. Um, our attention to those technologies can be very different from our attention to live in-person music. Um, so we can be mindful of how long our sessions are, how long our experiences are, as well to create a safe, um, predictable, and um, sensory-friendly experience. Um, here are some of my favorite go-to apps for, um, you know, just starting to introduce technology into your sessions um, that um, are really easy, you know, just press a key or touch something and, you know, you're always going to have success with it. Um, and these are great ways to change up and create um, create more variety in your telehealth sessions as well. You know, really taking advantage of being in the technology space and all of the, um, you know, all of the creative options that that brings to us as music therapists. And then I think Andrea is gonna drop some of those links to the things that I'm, um, the, that list uh, in the chat. So, um, all in all, technology and um, COVID has, and how those two things have interacted has radically changed the way that we practice. And I believe it will change the way we practice for foreseeably ever. Um, and um, something that I came up against when, when COVID hit was you know, the same fears that I felt before as a music therapist of, you know, the, the same fears that a lot of us have about being an alternative therapy um, of how do I fund what I do? How do I advocate what for what I do? And how do I help people understand that it's valuable? Um, so it's been so interesting now to be on the home and personal care side of things. Well, while still practicing as a music therapist, what I've been able to observe is um, how much of our resources um, go to maintenance, go to just the basics of living. Um, in my state, Ohio, um, we spend $3.8 billion um, to serve only 90,000 people with disabilities, which is not even all the people with disabilities who need home and personal care services. Um, and 
one of the things that really changed the way that I thought about it was I learned that, you know, one of the people that, that we serve at LAD where I work now, um, she is incredibly independent. She doesn't need assistance for most of her daily living skills. However, she needs someone there 24 seven because she has seizures. And so we pay someone <laughs> to sit with her 24 seven for the one time every three months where she has a seizure. Um, so the unfortunate part about that is not just the, the cost element, but you know, she loses out on a level of independence as well that, that she could have, um, you know, if it just weren't for these seizures. Um, so with the advances of technology, um, I, I believe that, you know, a new model may emerge where we can meet some of those basic needs with technology. Um, if we were able to even reduce one hour of in-person HPC or home and personal care services with assistive technologies and remote supports, um, my state would save $936,000 just from the individuals we serve right now. Um, so we could be on the cusp of something really, um, really amazing here. Um, and so I want to share with you a little bit about how amazing <laughs> this future could be. And I hope that, you know, this will give you the same hope that it gave me that there will be a place in the future for the meaningful services that music therapists and other health professionals have, and that there one day will be the resources to get those out to people. Um, so I'm going to do a little Zoom movie magic and go um, invite one of the guys who lives in this amazing smart technology house. And we're going to give you a little Zoom room tour of the sensory room in here and, and how it works. And uh, he might tell you a little bit about himself and um, what it's like to live in a tech house and, and all that good stuff. So give me just one second for movie magic and I'll be right back with you. Hey, how's it going? Good. You wanna introduce yourself a little bit? My name is Matt. Um, I lived at Victory Parkway. I now live here in Anderson. Um, I grew up here in Anderson actually. Um, I am, lived here in Anderson since the 30th of September. So brand new change, right? Right, brand new change. Uh, I love it. Oh, awesome. All right, cool. So you want to go show them our uh, sensory room? Sure. Cool. So Matt, tell them, tell them maybe what, what kinds of things do you like to do? I like to, um, I like to listen to music. I like to um, teach people things such as riding public transit, mm -hmm. as well as um, I give presentations. Very cool. Oops. Okay. So this is our sensory room um, at the Smart House. We have a you know, sensory chair that provides um, some kind of like containment. Um, it almost feels like a hug to sit in, which is cool. Um, in addition, we've got a bubble tube up here. Um, we've got some Alexa integration and some cool lights. Um, so Matt, why don't you um, show them how um, the Alexa turns on your blast music. Okay. Hey Alexa, play Matt's blast. Matt's blast doesn't support that. What? Let's try it again. Hey Alexa, turn on Matt's Blast. Okay. Oops. Hey Alexa, turn on Matt's Blast. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
touchpad as well right so i'll show you matt's calm right here my favorite <laughs> the river there it is So each of the guys who um, live at the house actually have their own their own setting for a blast and a calm that was programmed in by our home automation team, which is really, really cool. Um, and they can access it by telling Alexa or using a touch pod, um, yes. whatever they prefer. That is yeah. yeah, okay, cool. So we're gonna do movie magic real quick again. And I'm going to switch over to my laptop. So Matt can maybe tell you a little bit about um, what it's been like to live at the tech house. So, Matt, why don't you tell them a little bit about what it's been like to live in the tech house? It's been great. I am really enjoying myself. Um, it was a big change as far as from where I was at Victory Parkway. Um, living with roommates has been a challenge, but I'm getting used to it now. Yeah, yeah, because you were living alone in right. the apartment before, right? Yeah. Um, what's been one of the hardest parts about like the technology and learning all of it? Um, dealing with when different Alexas are playing at one time. We also have um, some problems with like Alexa's. If Alexa's playing in one room, it doesn't want to play music in another room because they're all like integrated. Um, so all kinds of weird tech yes. adventures. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, what's been the coolest thing about having all this technology? I think the coolest thing for me is um, the coolest thing for me would be just learning different ways to play music and uh, look up stuff such as bus schedules and things things that I need for my daily life. Yeah, so it sounds like um, you've been able to do those things like more independent with the technology. Mm -hmm. That's Very cool. cool. Awesome. Well, well, thanks for, for helping me out, Matt. Oh, God, no problem. <laughs> Matt, Matt likes to do presentations himself. What do you like to present on? Um, I'm actually working on one on lab now. I'm using, I'm doing the tech house as part of that. Um, I've been trying to work on this for a while, but you know, it's been hard to do. <laughs> a lot of work. It has. I feel you, man. <laughs> um, well, do you guys have any, any questions for Matt before he heads out? Hey, Matt, this is Becky in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. I was wondering, um, have you used the computer at all to have um, any um, chats with people you know or any sessions? And how have, how have you been liking that? I um, used the computer for that um, to have chats with my bus friends that I used to ride the bus with, my best friend, Leslie. I love it. Yeah, and you, you have remote support too, right? Yeah, that's true. So some of your staff call in. Right. What's that been like, and how is it different from having staff in person? It's way different. It, I'm, staff isn't there for me all the time, and I, will, I won't know who to turn to if I need help. Hmm. Hmm. So it, it, you know, it sounds like some 
sometimes it's a challenge. Yes, it can be. But I know you also like being like independent a lot right. too. Right. So there's a lot of kind of balancing that we have to do in making that adjustment, right? Right. Yeah. I'm Linda and I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I was just wondering, do you get opportunities to make music? Um, I just listen to it. Not usually. I'm hoping to someday. <laughs> well, we can definitely do that together, I think. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I love doing that. I do too. Thanks for I've having actually me. played, um, sing while my dad's played on guitar, so. <laughs> Has music been an important part of your life? It has been, yeah, ever since I was young. Thanks for answering. I appreciate it. Um, Matt, I, like my, this, so. I have one question, Matt. My name is Heather. I live in Connecticut, actually. So you've got all over the, the country here. I wow. wanted to ask you, you mentioned that your dad plays guitar and you sing with him. Have you been able to do that via Zoom or any other technology like that during the um, pandemic? No, I, that would be kind of hard, but um, I have, in the past, I've sang with him when we've done in-person sessions. It's not, it's better, isn't it? Yeah, better <laughs> yeah it's easier too. <laughs> Maybe you could try it though. True, I could, possibly. I do know we do a lot of singing in our downtown. <laughs> sorry, Alexandra, a little closer to the mic if you can. Yeah, sorry, it's probably the mask. Um, I know we do a lot of singing around the house with all the Alexas. We'll put on music, especially when like dinners, we're making dinner <laughs> and stuff, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your help, Matt. No um, and I will see you around. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, do you guys have any questions for me? Because we're a small group, I think it's fine if you want to just unmute and ask the question to feel free. And But if you prefer to type it in the chat, I can moderate that way too. Alexander. What's, what is it like for you? Yeah. I mean, what's it like to, I'm, it just seems like, you know, it's a great place to be, but it's kind of complex. I mean, you've got all these personalities coming in that maybe don't have access to their families or ready access and mm. just, um, yeah, it's in trying to stay on top of the technology and Keep mm. relationships going and conflict <laughs> resolution and all that that yeah. it sounds like a a bunch of stuff <laughs> right yeah well um actually i i think as matt mentioned the house opened um on at the end of september mm -hmm. so um all this transition happened during covid and you know we had to help the guys not only <laughs> Um, you know, get to know each other, but we had to tr help them at least gain some familiarity with the technology without, you know, the experts of that technology being there in person. Um, so it was, it was a real challenge. And I would say that, that now um, the hardest part has been, um, I think, like going through such a big helping these guys through such a big life transition um in such a strange environment as it is <laughs> right right now really um because two of the guys came from um living at home and uh one came from um more of like a group home setting and the other uh, matt he came from living in an apartment so um it's been a very different change for like everyone um, and managing that as well as building a, I mean, it's basically building a whole new program that has never existed. Nothing ever like it has existed. So it's been tough. I'm not going to lie, but it's also been really interesting. Um, and, you know, as music therapists, we certainly never like to be bored. So I can say that I'm never bored. <laughs>
Have you chronicled this? Have you, uh, you know, do you, you put, maybe you don't even have time to do that, but you know, some <laughs> kind, of <journal. laughs> kind of a journal of your journey through this because this is unique. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. think it is, yeah. At yeah. least in the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I haven't really formally done, done much of that. Um, but we are, um, LAD is collaborating with um, a local university, Xavier University in their occupational therapy department to um, do research on cost effectiveness, um, as well as um, the independence benefits of each piece of technology um, we've implemented in the house. Um, so, you know, other than the sensory room that we kind of showed off, um, you know, we have everything from like a smart fridge that shows what's inside to um, you know, lights that turn on when you walk in the pantry, like all sorts of different, different types of technologies. I'm curious, Alexandra, what yeah. you see your, um, your experience as a music therapist, like how I, I can just see like your wheels turning around things and though, you know, the things that it's so new, right? What you're doing. Yeah. I'm just curious what you see the potential for integrating more music therapy kinds of things into what you're doing. For sure. Well, um, the creative and motivating teaching element is, I think, um, a big aspect of where I see music therapy playing a role, um, at least in the, in the model itself of, um, you know, establishing um, these sorts of, you know, tech-based houses where people are able to live more independently. So I see music therapy playing a role in that teaching. Um, and, you know, um, we all know as users of technology how we tune out alerts that we don't care about. Um, so um, especially with one of the guys, he is just an absolute music lover. So I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if his video with his PT exercises was to music? Um, and, you know, I, I did that. And wouldn't it be cool that if he, when he went to go check his alerts, he could also find um, some of his favorite videos, um, music videos, or just videos he enjoys watching. So that's, that's where I see that, that music therapy mindset, like really coming into play is, um, how do we make this interesting? How do we make it fun and motivating for the people that we work with? Um, so that's one aspect. And then I think the other aspect is more that, um, that like safe, um, safe emotional side of things of helping people through a transition that they, you know, never maybe even imagined for themselves. Like, um, you know, there are lots of people who are living in the middle class who would never be able to, um, you know, never be able to get a waiver to live alone with staff. So they would be living with their family, essentially, um, for most of their life. Um, and that's great if that's what you want, but that's not necessarily what everyone's choice would be if there were a choice. <laughs> Do you have any, um, like debriefing it, it with the group of um, residents? Yeah, um, well, we have just, just kind of moved in. So a lot of what we're doing now is like, just like establishing routines. Like mm -hmm. um, what is our routine gonna be? Um, and a lot of what that support has looked like right now is um, a lot of individual check-ins. Um, cause the guys are still, you know, getting comfortable with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely see, um, more of those group, co group conversations coming into play. Um, as we've, we're just, we're like halfway through week three. So I see those like group roommate meetings, like starting to, you know, be a big part of, of how these guys navigate, um, what they do together. Because I mean, I think part of Part of removing um, removing in-person staff, I think, 
is helping the guys rely on each other and their own strengths um, to live independently as much as it is um, helping them use the technologies that are there to help them. And we know how great that music is for that relationship building, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, Becky in Chicago. Mm -hmm. This isn't really a, as much a music question, more geared toward the technology side. Yeah. Um, it, it seems, you know, it's LAD is, is like this bigger organization, mm -hmm. right? And you guys are like the technology house. Mm -hmm. I know, I know you're new, but how do you see mm -hmm. um, bringing what you're doing into other parts of lad i um i have i work um a little bit with an organization kind of similar um in the chicago suburbs um and before covid i was going into their day program mm -hmm. into different rooms of i had the their retirees and one of their um one of their adult rooms and then when covid hit they had, you know, the day program stopped and everyone was stuck in their group homes. And I was able to yeah. get into one of the group homes mm -hmm. using telehealth because I had an individual in that group home. And like, and that group has gone and, and I've brought in her housemates into the group and it's gone yeah. really, 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 really well. And it's like, I can't get it to go into the other parts of the organization. Like that mm -hmm. just that hasn't happened. And right. I know that everyone is everyone else in all of the other group homes are, they don't have these like Zoom opportunities. So how um, do you bring some of this that you're doing in this one home into other parts of LAD? I know you just got there, but like, yeah. <laughs> are, are, there, are there plans for that or, or how might you see that? In yeah, the for sure. So we're actually already doing some expansion um, of remote services. Um, so what we're doing that's really new here is um, the idea of taking remote supports and using them during the day, as well as sort of the assistive technology element is pretty, pretty brand new. What's not necessarily new is using remote supports overnight to support people um, with disabilities. Um, so we're already kind of rolling that out. Um, in addition, during COVID, um, we as an organization, LAD, has um, uh, implemented some really strict, um, you know, no crossover um, sorts of, of rules in order to prevent um, COVID spread, um, which has been really successful for our organization. Um, so um, we actually, there were never any plans to implement any of this remote support technology until after it was tested here. But COVID totally changed that. Um, for future expansion in general, though, um, the idea is that, you know, this will be like the tester house. So basically, we'll, we, this, this house will allow us to see what works, what doesn't work, um, and what might work for who as well. Um, because we know that, um, you know, a one size fits all solution is is not the game that we play um, uh, as you know music therapist or you know in the world of um, disability either um, we have to find many different solutions for many different people um, so part of that expansion will be um, to identify um, what pieces of technology are useful to people and to whom they might be useful for. And to expand um, the technology in a more, um, more purposeful manner rather than just like, you know, decking it out with everything, which is sort of what we've done here, just, just so we can actually get some real data, like some real like people using this, some to see what what works and what doesn't, um, because what LAD found really when they um, started pursuing this idea is that a lot of these tech houses are basically showpieces. The very few that exist um, are 
just for show and no one's actually living there. Um, so we're not actually getting any information about what it might, how it might impact people's lives. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I hope that you won't, I, I feel like I'm butting up against kind of like, all right, we just, we aren't, we don't do that. Like you're doing that at that one house, but that's that mm -hmm. one house. And so I, I really hope that you won't have that battle. And yeah. that, I mean, it seems like you know, the organization is really supportive of, and like, I mean, they're the ones that started it. So mm -hmm. Um, I just, I wish you the, the best of luck with that. Yeah, and thank you. Can, yeah, let me know. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, I think the big thing is, um, I'm sure you've experienced this, it sounds like, and something that I've experienced is um, there's a lot of resistance in, in the healthcare field to technology, not because I think people don't like it, but I think they just don't understand it. <laughs> Like, um, I've definitely come up against that of people just not even knowing what it can do. And there are also a lot of fears about, you know, well, if there's a camera here, like, you know, what, what does that mean? Like, um, you know, so we have to do a lot of work as well to ensure that um, the technology we implement is, is promoting independence and is not taking away independence. Um, so I think there are a lot of fear, like the big brother sort of fears <laughs> when we put technology in, in a house. Um, so we have to be really mindful about how we approach that. Um, like, um, so one of the features that we have is for all of our telehealth monitors that are like basically tablets attached to the wall. Um, individuals always have like a right to refuse. Um, and, you know, there are some circumstances where maybe someone couldn't get to, um, get to press the accept button if there was like an emergency or some sort of thing. But we have strict protocols in place to ensure that if we do have to force a call through that, um, you know, it is individual based, it is needs based, um, and it, it's respectful and least intrusive to the individual. Wonderful. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to say thank you to Alexandra for your, your time and your expertise and to Matt as well. Please send our regards to Matt and yeah. thank him for his part as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful information. Totally. So uh, let's see. So thank you, Alexandra, and thank you to those of you who joined us. Um, please mark your calendars for next week as our final um, grand round at on October 22nd at 9 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Chichen Sophia Lee, who is presenting Techie, not Tacky, Accommodating Technologies in Delivering Music Therapy Education Remotely. So thank you, everyone, and please stay, stay safe and well.